Well, tomorrow is Veterans Day. And the men and the women who have served in the armed forces of the United States of America have contributed to protecting the safety and the security of our liberty, uh, of our way of life in the United States of America, of our culture and our society. They've done a job that is vital to our existence. They've done a job that is necessary. They've done a job that is sometimes difficult. They've done jobs that too often were dangerous. But they have not done a job that should be thankless or forgotten. And even though our expressions of gratitude are trivial compared to what they have done, I hope that you who have served would be, be willing to stand for us, please, and let us thank you for your service. Men and women who are veterans, would you please stand? Thank you so much. Jesus promised after his resurrection to send the Holy Spirit to be with his people in this age, what we call often the church age, the age between the first coming of Jesus when he died for our sins and was raised up, and the second coming of Jesus. He is with God now. He's promised to come back. We're waiting that for that uh, event. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we have God's Spirit in our hearts, in our lives, in our churches to empower us, to enable us to serve him and to fill, fulfill the task, the mission that he has given us. And uh, so we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a spirit-filled Christian? What are we supposed to do about that? There are four commands in the New Testament about God's Holy Spirit, two positive, two negative. They are these, be filled by the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, don't quench the Spirit, and don't grieve the Spirit. Be filled Walk, don't quench, don't grieve. This morning, I'd like to look at the first of those four commands, be filled by the Spirit. So would you open your Bibles, please, with me to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. Ephesians 5 and 15. Get your bulletin out, turn it over. We'll take a couple of notes as we go along this morning. Here's what it says. Watch carefully, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity for the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled by the Holy Spirit. Paul's letters, and this is one of them, originally a letter written by the Apostle Paul, inspired by God's Spirit, and so it's a word to all believers at all times. But originally, it was a letter written by the Apostle to believers in, in Ephesus, and all of his letters tend to be divisible into two. The first part of the letter talks about what we need to know about what God has done for us, and the second part of the letter generally talks about what we need to do about that. In the first part of this letter, he tells us what we need to know about the Holy Spirit is that he has sealed us, that he is a down payment toward our eternal inheritance. He has marked us as belonging to God. We are his sons and daughters. We have been adopted by him. That's a great thing to know. We need to know that as believers. That's where we stand with God. But there's also a what do we need to do about it? And we're in the part of the letter now that answers that question. So what should we do about this fact that God's Spirit has sealed us, that He is in our hearts and in our lives? What does it mean to be a Spirit-filled Christian in this age? And this text that I've just read to you gives us three contrasts to begin answering the question. He begins by saying, watch carefully how you live. The word literally is walk, walk. Watch carefully how you walk. He means live, and so our English translations just go ahead and take that extra step and put the word live. But in the Bible, both the Old Testament, the word halak, and in the New Testament, the word peripateo are used over and over again for what kind of life we live. It's our walk, and many of us uh, grew up hearing that. How's your walk with the Lord going? That's a biblical way of putting it because our lives are lived one step at a time. And every time we take a step, we're either moving toward the right destination or we're moving toward the wrong destination. And the fact that we're walking through life is a reminder of that. It's also good news. The news is that if I could take a step in the wrong direction, not that I don't love you people over here on this side of the congregation, 
And I should have been walking in this direction. Y'all are great. You know, if I take one step in the wrong direction, it doesn't mean it's over. The fact that God is allowing us to walk through life means that we can make a misstep and we can recover from that and we, we can take two steps, one back and then one in the right direction and we're back where we need to go. So maybe you've taken some missteps in your life. You are walking toward the goal. Just move back and get on the right path and walk in the right way. Don't give up. Don't give up. Notice the first contrast is between unwise and wise. This is Old Testament sounding literature. The Old Testament talks a lot about what it means to live a wise life. In our uh, culture, we like people who are smart, they're knowledgeable, but smart and knowledgeable people are not always wise, not by the Bible standards. Because in the Bible, wisdom is about knowing God, knowing his ways, and doing those things. And so that's what he means in the next verse, verse 16, when he says, don't be foolish, that's the uh, contrast between wisdom, don't be foolish, And, and look at the contrast between foolishness uh, and, and he here, he doesn't use the word wise. He says the opposite of being foolish is knowing what the will of the Lord is. Actually, the word is understand, understanding the will of the Lord. There are a couple of, ver- uh, couple of uh, words that are used in the New Testament commonly for know, gnosko and wida, uh, and they're all over the New, New Testament. Neither of those words is used here. This word is suneami. Suneami is a relatively rare, rare word in the New Testament. It means to put it together. Put it together, literally. Take all the pieces and put them in the right order. You know, we can know a lot, but still not put it together. A lot of people know a lot of things, and they never get it together, you know? Uh, and we want to get it together. And, and what we're getting together is we want to take God's will, and we put it, put it together with our life, our daily life. We take his will, we understand what that will is, we know it, and we put it into action. That's what he is talking about here. Now he comes to the third contrast, and this is where the Spirit comes, and he says, don't get drunk on wine. Can we just stop right there? That's good advice. And you can fill in any kind of drug or any kind of thing that you might be using to alter your consciousness. Just stop it. If you're struggling with that kind of addiction, my heart goes out to you because I did for many years. And I know how difficult it is to beat an addiction. But I am no longer an addict. And I don't have to go to an AA meeting and say, hi, my name's Richard, I'm an alcoholic, because I'm not. It's broken. And I want to give you some hope this morning, if you're struggling with an addiction, that it is possible not just to manage that addiction, but to break it. It is possible to walk away from it and to be free from it for the rest of your life. Even if it's something as simple as cigarettes, because I had that addiction too. And believe it or not, it was the hardest addiction of all to break. Of all the drugs and the alcohol and so forth, it was nicotine that had its hooks in me the most. And I was not able to do it, but God was able to do it in me. All right, well, that was just a little banner ad. Let's come back to the text. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to... I love looking at the English translation to see what kind of word they use here. I think the NIV uses debauchery, debauchery. Now, that's not a word you use every day, is it? Dissipation. And one of the the standard works for Greek English, uh, they recommend this word. Here's a good one, profligacy, profligacy. Don't you love that word? I mean, you heard that just Friday on the job, didn't you? You know, hey, man, I'm going to go out and get me some profligacy tonight. Oh, no, you don't want none of that profligacy. You know, these are just not words that we use typically, uh, not even the word debauchery, although we probably come closer to understanding what that means. This is not just wasteful living. It is wasteful, destructive living. Because when we live addicted to the things of this world, it, we're not just wasting our lives, we destroy them. And quite often we destroy people around us as well. Okay? So he's saying, don't do that. Here's the contrast. Instead, notice he doesn't say, don't get drunk, be sober. That's what you might expect from this contrast. But instead of saying, don't get drunk, be sober, he says, don't get drunk, be filled by the Spirit. Why is that? Because every one of us has got to be filled with something. You know, you just can't walk around an empty shell. Our souls require something to fill us, and we'll find something to fill us. And what we're made to be filled with 
is God our Father. What we're made to be filled with is His presence, His power, and His Spirit. And so that's why Paul makes this contrast. He says, don't get drunk on the things of this world, on wine or whatever, but be filled by the Spirit. He says by the Spirit, by the way, there's a, two ways to take this. You can take it as the Spirit being the content that we're filled with, or you can take it as the Spirit being the one who is filling us, the one who is filling us, and the latter is probably the case. The latter is probably the case. He's, he's calling for us to allow God's Holy Spirit to fill us. Well, then that asks the question, well, what is the content with which he is filling us? Because the Holy Spirit's already in us. If you're a believer, you don't need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because the minute you put saving faith in Jesus Christ, you were baptized in the Holy Spirit that very instant. And you never need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit again. But we need to be filled by the Spirit. We need to be filled by the Spirit. One person has put it this way, I may have all of the Spirit, but does the Spirit have all of me? There's a process that is going on where we need to learn to submit ourselves to the Spirit. Notice what he says, be filled by the Spirit. Not, not fill yourself with the Spirit. It's not an active verb, it is a passive verb. This is something we cannot do. I can't fill myself with the Spirit. You can't either. I have to be filled by the Spirit. I have to put myself in a position where the Holy Spirit will fill me with the pleroma, the fullness of God. If you want to continue this line of thinking, later on today, look up Ephesians 3.19, 3.19, and study that and follow it through. I'm not going to do that this morning. I'll leave that with you. The pleroma, the fullness of God. So here's the first question this morning. Uh, basically, now what? So we've got the Spirit, now what? What are we supposed to do about that? Uh, and here's how I put it. After being sealed with the Spirit, because we are sealed with the Spirit, that's our baptism in the Spirit, believers must submit to the Spirit. Now, I could say we must be filled with the Spirit, but I don't want to use the same words that are in the verse. I want to use some different words that will be descriptive and help you think it through. So here's what I'm going to, I'm going to put the word submit in here. Because since it's a passive verb and it says that we've got to be filled, to be filled means we've got to submit to something. We've got to allow God to do something in our lives so that the Holy Spirit can fill us. Well, what is it that we must do? Look at what happens next uh, in verses 19 through 21. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, this is a fantastic piece of Scripture here for so, so many reasons. Uh, and one of the first things that I love about these verses is the, the multiple mentions of music, uh, because I love music. Uh, and I love the fact that we have great music here at Grace Baptist Church. You know, music has important, been important to the people of God for millennia. Uh, all the way back into the Old Testament, music was important to their worship. David, King David spent a lot of time focusing on the music in the temple and just making sure that it was right, making sure that the right people were uh, in charge of it. And, and after him, they continued to do that. When we come to the New Testament, we realize that music continues to be very important to the New Testament church. The people of God have always been a singing people. We've always been a singing people. That's part of what God does. He puts it into our hearts to sing his praises. Some of you are saying, not me. You don't want to hear me sing. Well, I may not want to, but God does. God does. You know, uh, it doesn't matter how good it is here. God's got something better in heaven. So uh, he, wants, he just wants to hear us sing because he's listening to what comes from our heart, not the technical precision of our musicianship. You know, we love that, and it's wonderful, but God just wants to hear our hearts. I, people have told me over the years as a pastor, they said, well, I don't sing in church. Nobody wants to hear me sing. And I say, hey, let me tell you something. There's somebody that wants to hear you sing. God wants to hear you sing. So you open your mouth and you sing in church. You may not ever be in the choir or stand on the platform, but open your mouth and sing to God and sing from your heart. Because that's who we are as a people. We are a singing people. And so he mentions all of these musical terms here. You know, there's going to be singing in heaven too. And let me tell you something about the, the music in heaven. It says that in heaven they will sing a new song. 
And it says in heaven that they will sing the song of Moses. Now, I don't know how much longer it's going to be before we get to heaven, but if it's tomorrow, the song of Moses is an old song. It's a traditional song. Okay, they've been singing the song of Moses for a long, long time. But don't miss this, in heaven they sing new songs. Can I put it this way? In heaven they sing contemporary and they sing traditional. Okay? And these words right here in this text, look at all the words you use, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now it's deadly to try to link those up with particular styles today because we don't know what they meant. But the fact that he uses a lot of words tells us that he, he was open and inclusive to a lot of different kind of styles let me tell you something church those of you in here who love traditional music i want to thank you for being patient loving and kind when we sing contemporary music and those of you in here brothers and sisters in christ who love the contemporary music i want to thank you for being patient and loving and kind when we sing traditional music and musicians i want to thank you those of you who love traditional music you go the extra mile and you work hard to try to learn some of this newfangled stuff and play it right and i want to thank those of you who love to play the new songs that you take the effort to learn some of the old stuff and play it right because you know your brothers and sisters in christ love to sing it That's what church is all about. That's the way it's supposed to be done. We may not do it perfect, but we're trying to do it the right way. So he says here that we we speak these uh, these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. Don't miss this. This is a this is not something that we're doing uh, alone at home in our prayer closet. We should be worshiping alone at home. That's that he's not against that, but he's talking about. Uh, being filled by the spirit and the first thing that comes to his mind is something that we do together as a church Uh, we speak to one another with spiritual truth so that we build one another up Uh, so don't miss that to one another the next one is what it's to the lord so we not only do it to one another we also do it to the lord we're not just here uh, to have a big therapy session and help each other out we're here to worship god we're here to, to praise God and to represent him well. So we do both of those things. Well, we do the horizontal uh, and we do the vertical. We minister to one another. We minister to God. We sing to one another. We sing to God. And that's what he is pointing out here. Now, look what he says next. The next one's hard. He says, giving thanks in verse 20 for everything, always. Now, this is tough. Now, we're talking about being filled with the Spirit and moving toward maturity in Christ. And I want to tell you this morning, this is a sign of maturity, and this is a sign that we're moving forward, that we're being filled with Christ, is that we recognize that we serve a sovereign God and nothing happens apart from His will. Nothing. He is in control of everything. And that in itself raises some difficult questions. I understand that. You mean God let my grandson die, you know, fill in the blank. Many of you could fill that blank in this morning and it becomes a very difficult question. I understand that. I want you to notice how he put this. Here's the order of the words, and your English translation may have changed it, but here's how he wrote it. He said, giving thanks always in all things, and he stopped right there and he said, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he finished his thought to God the Father. Now, why did he interject those words in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? Because he knew when he said giving thanks for all things uh, at at all times, immediately what people were going to say, I can't give thanks always for all things. There are things in my life that I cannot give thanks for. And he says, don't forget Jesus. Jesus suffered unfairly more than any of us ever will. And God took those bad things that happened to Jesus, and he turned them into salvation for his people. We as a people, as a spirit-filled people, reach a point in our spiritual pilgrimage where we understand that the bad things that happen in this world, the bad things that happen to us, our family, our church family, and our community are things that God didn't plan, but there are things that he can take and use redemptively, and he can make good things come out of it. Did you notice what it said earlier? He said the days are evil. The days are evil. We do. We live in an evil world, uh, and we want to make the most. We want to redeem the time, literally is what that says, 
uh, back there in verse 16, to redeem the time, to make the most of the opportunities that we have. If you are speaking to your brothers and sisters in Christ with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with spiritual truth, if you're singing to God and your, uh, with your heart, if you're being grateful to God, then you are making the, oppor- the most of the opportunities. You are redeeming the time. When you see the opportunity to read your Bible, when you see the opportunity to pray, when you see the opportunity to witness to somebody and tell them about Jesus, then you're making the most of the opportunities. If we don't do that, then we're not. We're not redeeming the time. We're allowing the evil days just to take over. He says, don't do that. Don't do that. Be filled by God's Spirit. And then the last thing he mentions here is submitting to one another uh, in the fear of Christ. And I use the word fear because it's phobos, and I know that fear is, is, uh, is a troublesome word. Our translations like to use reverence. I don't disagree with that necessarily, but I think the word reverence is a little light, L-I-T-E. Um, there is some fear of the Lord. God is mighty. He's great. He doesn't want us to fear him in a debilitating way that shuts us down. He wants us to fear him in a way that inspires us to serve him. I want to serve him because he's a mighty God. Now, So there's five actions here, speaking, singing, making melody, giving thanks, and submitting. And this is a fascinating study, which we don't have time to do, and if I got into the details, you'd start throwing things at me anyway, so let me just keep it simple. There's there's two things we have to decide. There's one of two things we have to choose here. We have to decide if the text is telling us this is what you have to do to be filled by the Spirit, or this is what happens to you when you get filled by the Spirit. Those are the, two, those are the two choices. All five of these actions line up. They're all expressed grammatically in exactly the same way. They're identical, even though our English translations do different things with them. They're all a package deal. And so we ask ourselves, do we have to do these things? Do I have to speak to you in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs in order to be filled by the Spirit? Is it a prerequisite? Or when the Spirit fills me, will I speak to you? in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, you can make a case for both, but I believe the second one is the more important one because there is nothing we can do to force God to fill us with his Spirit. But there are things that we can do to run from his Spirit. And there are things that we can do to put ourselves in a position where we can receive that Spirit. And so that kind of blurs these actions a little bit. They sort of hang on the fence, a little on one side and a little on the other side, but that's what a lot of spiritual truth is like. It's multifaceted. There are layers to it. Surely those of you who have been studying the Bible for years have figured that out. That's why we keep reading the same book year after year after year because every time we read it, God shows us something new. There's a lot there. And there's a lot in these, this text right here. But there's two things that are clear that from this text about being filled with the Spirit. If you take inventory of everything that's in here, and we haven't looked carefully at everything, but one is that there are negative things that we have to do. There are things that we have to stay away from. The evil times, being foolish, being drunk with wine, all of those things. He's saying there, there are things that you, we need to not do. We need to avoid if we're going to be spirit-filled Christians, and then there's the positive side. There's things that we need to do. And one of the things that you notice in this text is that the positive side is filled with things that we do together in church. Now, don't get me wrong. You can be filled by the Spirit on your own, but it's, hap- it's dangerous. You know, Elijah was a very spirit-filled man, and God kept bringing him back into town and saying, hey, you need to minister to these people. I've given you your spirit. I've given you my spirit. I've given you the power that you need to minister to these people, quit hiding out there. You know, he let the brook dry up. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some water at the brook for a while, but it's going to dry up. I want you back in town. And when he came back in town, mighty things happened. Fire came from heaven and licked up the offering and the water around it. You know the story if you don't look it up. But Elijah, he had this problem with wanting to be on his own. And so as soon as that was all over, he ran back out was on his own again, and God came to him. You remember what God asked him? Elijah, what are you doing here? This isn't where I sent you. Why aren't you with my people? And Elijah was a stubborn old goat, and he didn't want to go back into town. And you know what God did? 
He said, all right, you're done. Take your mantle and give it to somebody else. God gives us his spirit to be used in the people of God. It's not something that we have to use for ourselves to develop ourselves personally. That's not the way this thing works. All right, here's the second question. What do Christians do? How do we submit to God's spirit? What do we do? Well, we could talk a lot about this, but let's just limit it to this text. And by limiting to this text, we come up with this answer. Uh, we submit to God's spirit by being, and again, I'm, trying to, I'm going to use words that are not in the text to, to help us think about the words that are in the text. Uh, this is not an exercise of just repeating the text. This is an exercise of triangulating the text and going deeper. Here's what I put. By being out of step with this world. Because this world is drunk on wine. This world is filled with evil days. This world is filled with foolishness and unwise things. And if we are spirit-filled Christians, we will be out of step with this world. People will notice you're doing something different from what everybody else does. But that's not enough. That's the negative side. By being out of step with this world and in fellowship with the church. In fellowship with the church. Now, I would go so far as to say this morning that if you cut yourself off from fellowship with believers, then you cut yourself off from the power of God's Spirit. This is where it happens in the local church. This is where God is working. This is where he reveals himself. We scatter and we do our thing, but we always come back together and we worship God over and over and over again. Four fellows got into a trimaran. Trimaran. I didn't know what that meant. It's a yacht with three parallel hulls off the coast of New Zealand. And they sailed out into the South Pacific. And when they got way out into the ocean, a freak giant wave came along and it turned their trimaran upside down. There was absolutely no way for them to write that ship the way it's configured, three parallel hulls. It was upside down. They were fortunate that it didn't sink. But here they are in the middle of the South Pacific uh, in a vessel that is upside down that cannot be righted. Uh, and so days go by, weeks go by, months go by. And there they are floating on this upside-down yacht, the four of them, and eventually their supplies ran out, and one of the most precious supplies of all was gone. Fresh water. Now, we can't live long without fresh water. Of course, they're surrounded by salt water, but you can't use that. Fresh water, they need fresh water. But every now and then, what happens out in the ocean? Clouds come, it thunders and lightnings, and life falls to the ground water fresh water god waters the earth he waters us and there they were life literally falling down around them and it was just rolling off the top of the ship and rolling off of them and going into the ocean and being wasted and they were dying and so here's what they did they decided that they had to build something to catch that fresh water and they had to build something a tank, some kind of a funnel and a tube and a tank so that when it rained, that fresh water would come into that tunnel and it would go through that tube into that tank and they could gather it and then they would have it to drink. They would have the life that they needed to continue on. And that's exactly what happened. And something similar to that happens to us. God is raining down life all around us with his Spirit. And we have to put ourselves into some kind of a position to catch what it is that he is giving us. We can ignore it. We can avoid it. We can run away from it. And someday God will say, I reigned my life, my spirit, my presence all around you. And you just didn't put your hands out. You just didn't stretch your heart out and catch it. And this text this morning is challenging us. Be filled by the spirit. Open your heart. Get in fellowship. Worship. Wait. Well, it may not happen this week, next week, next month, but God is testing you to see if you're serious. You know, it amazes me that we'll go to the doctor and we will accept the fact that he's going to give us a stress test. I don't even like the name of it. Oh, well, that's just what doctors do. He's doing it for my good. He needs to find out 
We need to find out what kind of shape I'm in so that if something needs to be done, I can be healed. We accept it from these physicians who minister to our bodies. Should we not accept it from the great physician who ministers to our eternal soul that he too gives us stress tests so that we can find out what needs to be healed in our life? Church, when those difficult times come, God has given you a stress test. And he has your best interest at heart. Open your hands, open your heart, and catch the life that he is raining down. Bow your heads with me, please.